Christ should come through, you know. You got to yield to the crowd, this person in the circle. They go through first. Uh, and so, I told the story once, back in the 70s, so I was asking God to teach me or help me with the love of God. And he was teaching me. He was giving me people to practice on. Some people you got to practice on the love. Uh-huh. It's not easy to love. But the, the, the honor of the love of God is that you had the heart to do it whether they understood it or not. Yeah. Most of them look for a thank you. I appreciate it. I was going to store one day on the door of his lady. And she didn't say thank you. Neither the man walked behind me. I said, they didn't say thank you. And the Holy Ghost quickly said to me, if you did it for the right reason, it really shouldn't matter. You do it because of the love of God. People see it or not, it doesn't matter. It's an honor to love like God. It's an honor to see a need and feel it. It's an honor, it's an honor to bear the lack thereof and give the abundance to it yes. and knowing that God is glorified. Now, God is glorified. Somebody might say hallelujah. Somebody might say thank you together. Thank you. They say put them hands together. God is glorified by the act of, of kindness in a day of an evil time. Uh, when you're in a situation where you want to fuss, cuss, and argue, you say, if I offend you, I'm sorry. And you can be right. That's the grace of God. And so there again, uh, uh, he said to me, if you did it for the right reason, it really shouldn't matter. Sometimes I plead for more prayer. And James 4 and 2 says, you have not because you ask not. And he saw that and in Isaiah 59 and 16, he says, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. An uh, intercessor was in the book of Job, I believe it was not scripture text, was um, that uh, Job said, I find me a man that can lay his hands upon God and me and can intercede between us. That's an intercessor that, 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 that can pray my behalf. And those of you that are familiar with the altar work, praying for souls, the altar worker really is the intercessor. You're praying that God, a way will be open for them to have access to God. You're praying that all hindrances, the thoughts, the things, the distractions, the emotions, the outside world, that God will give them free access to his presence. And you instructed him. I say hallelujah. Uh, get your mind on the Lord. You intercede. He says, Job said, my, I can lay his hands upon God and myself. Amen. Uh, what else do I have right here? Let's see. That's in Job. Uh, 9.33, where he says, neither is there neither is there any daysman betwixt us. And the word daysman is translated as umpire betwixt us that might lay his hands upon us both. So the intercessor, in a manner of speaking, sometimes some assignments are given by God. Intercessor, God gives them an assignment to pray for someone. Uh, God can wake you up. Uh, I said midnight hour, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Somebody said, who needs prayer one, two, or three o'clock in the morning? Well, one or two or three o'clock in the morning in South Africa is six hours ahead of us. Somebody could be having a heart attack. Somebody could have a nervous breakdown. Somebody could be having a stroke. And the person is essential to the work of this time that God has placed in the position of the word of grace on their life to speak to this generation. This generation is a, it's a difficult generation. Uh, they think a degree makes them qualified to speak on any subject. But there's still this experience. Um... Uh, March is, is March, April. Last six of March, I've been saved 57 years. So I learned a little bit of something. I've been through my shared trials and tests, and, and and thank God when He sent me through hell, I didn't have no gas, no 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 gasoline in my underwear. <laughs> so I made it out, and God delivered me back alive. I mean, literally. In 2020, I was in a coma for a month, and God delivered me. And my perspective of life has really changed because I believe that He left me here. To help somebody. We need help. Even I need help. Now, I would encourage any leader, whether it be auxiliary leader, ministry leader, or pastor specifically, if you haven't done already, to appoint someone to intercede for you. Uh, the changes we go through, you can't. I remember I'm going through a, 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 a test of my life. From the kitchen to the living room, I can be hit with a bottle of depression. Because you're dealing with something. It can come all of a sudden. And you're going to know how to pray your way through it. Some things God allows is to give you for experience. Once the experience is gained, now your discernment is heightened. You can sense and tell. Uh, I mean, I even know your name. I can tell this, 
person needs help from God. Uh, I can teach you a doctrine of baptism. That's all true. There's no other way but the way of holiness. It's right to be baptized in Jesus' name. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But those who are carrying that load needs prayer, needs help. And so that's in Isaiah. He saw that there was no daysman and wondered that there was no intercessor. There is none that call upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of this. Isaiah 64 and 7. The church of our day was more of the spirit and practice of intercession. That was a norm. The saints prayed. Uh, they would say, the Lord laid you on my heart. I was in prayer last night. And the Lord showed me your face. And they prayed. Then they say, now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul, to come. Lord, in the name of Jesus, deliver, Lord. Uh, uh, and, and I pray that God would give me words that might not only help to direct attention to the evil, but specifically that my stir of faith and waken the assurance that God, by his spirit, will enable us to pray as we are. God has to help us. Uh, some people want to, don't know how to. I, be, I think prayer is something we learn to do um, to our preachers that are preaching. One of the best places to practice your preaching is on your knees. Uh, God will anoint your spirit, give you a word, or you'll feel the empowerment and uh, uh So somebody learned that prayer was more important than study. Billy Graham said, in his latter days, I wish I would have studied and prayed more than I preached. Uh, it's not just for yourself, for others. Sometimes our ability to pray is not for me, but for others as well uh, in that regard. Uh, so in substance, that is was simply a question of whether the call of God for our time and attention was more important than that of man. If God was waiting uh, to meet us, to give us blessing and power from heaven for his work, it was a short-sighted policy to put other work in place which God, which God and waiting on him should have. Meaning that uh, as a pastor, I first became pastor here 32, 33 years ago, and I had skills. I was a mechanical engineer, and I was fixing the air conditioning unit and climbing over the place, and I realized I need to slow my roll and get back, as the apostle said in the book of Acts 8 chapter, to give myself to prayer and the word of God. And then God was able to help me. You might say, man, I, you, are you still fixing this? No, I don't have time for that. I have to give myself to prayer. And prayer, God, allows you to interact with his mind. He shares his heart with you. His things are unseen. He shares the future. He sent, like, sent a word out to your support systems. It could be legal, financial, uh, wisdom of counseling, interaction, God can put things in place and give you the grace. And in leadership, people don't recognize in leadership, um, leadership automatically has pain. Y'all know that? Leadership brings pain. I'm going to go to a place here, share something with you. Uh, the writer talking about leadership pain. I make a recommendation to the author name of Samuel Chan. And Chan says, Difference in great works and small works is not preaching style or managing ability. It's the ability to handle pain. You're going to be hurt. You're going to go through. And people think that that's something you just do. But those of you in leadership, would you agree? People say things, there are expectations that are unfounded. And I began reflecting uh, on things recently. And my kids, my son will be 35 yesterday. My girls are 32, I think. Oh, some, it was somewhere close to you anyway. You kind of lose track after a while. And I thought about the times my, my grandson, who's about eight to nine weeks old, and I held him in my arms. I said, I don't remember holding my kids this young. I was almost repenting and remorseful. I thought about it for a few days. And I said to myself, I really can't be sorry because, watch, my girls were born three months before I started pastoring. I'm in the thick of it. Pastoring the church, a little Lamar, there was time I heard him saying, that young, that boy don't know what he's doing. They're going to drive him crazy. And they wait for me to go crazy. But instead of getting crazy, I got smarter. Because <laughs> I stayed with God. There was time I come to church on a Saturday afternoon and say to church all night long, God, I need your help. They told me that was a kid. They told me how to pray. 
today's world, that's almost a lost art. We pray, we pray sometimes to bless our food. We should pray, we took a trip. We have a serious prayer. Lord, we pray your protection of the highway, God. You deliver us safely to our destination. Be with us, oh God, to watch over us. Now we get in the car. As long as we got gas and, and, the, and the GPS thing, we gone. Amen. And so I began to realize I can't repent because I don't remember now. I said I didn't do it. I don't remember. Those things kept out. Your, and, and, and leadership, your priority is steady changing. Sometimes God will help you change with grace. But I began to realize I couldn't have done what I'd done unless God had helped me. Now, my praying and seeking God is working doing Bible class all that. Guess what? He watched over my family. He protected my children and my wife. My wife now, I told her the other last week, I said, honey, you're going through a lot. You need a break. I said, tell you what, I'm going to buy you a plane ticket. Go to Savannah and take a break with your sister. She's on the announce. We can back home tomorrow. But I realized she needs a break. You know why? She's been through cancer, three bouts of cancer. See, she rung the bell three times. Remission, three times. The last time she had to do what? Radiation therapy. That's pretty intense stuff. Her hair was almost gone. She got it back now. It's blacker than it was before it fell out. God is gracious. Prayer is healing. Not just in the prayer line. I've been in services where healing moved throughout the congregation. Healing was in this service. Healing was in the preaching. And so we all know the difference between a man whose prophets are just enough to maintain his family and keep up his business and another whose income enables him to extend the business and to help others. They are maybe an earnest Christian life um, in which there is prayer enough to keep us from going back and just maintain the position we have attained to without much growth in spirituality or Christ-likeness. Who is the question? Have we grown much? Are we growing? Are we, are we becoming a better Christian, a better saint? Am I just saved? And so the attitude is more defensive, seeking to ward off temptation than aggressive, reaching out after higher attainment. If there is indeed to be a going from strength to strength with some large experience of God's power to sanctify ourselves and to bring down real blessings, watch, on others, there must be more definite and persevering prayer. Uh, see, Bishop um, Burrell is here. Bishop, I'm trying to follow the tradition of our diocese, Bishop Combs. And so this table, you can sit right here. You want to, sir? You want to, when you have some comments later on, you'd like to. You want to sit right here, you want, sir? And so the key is you're not just enough power for myself, but to bring down blessings on others. Uh, the scripture teaching about crying day and night, continuing steadfastly in prayer, watching to prayer, being heard for his importunity, must in some degree become our experience if we are really intercessors. The word importunity is a word uh, that the English dictionary doesn't address it uh, very well. It's kind of limited. Well, I'm going to give you another one uh, here uh, that talks about, let's see, definition. Uh, it's occurring only in Luke 11 and 8. This Greek word implies an element of impudent insistence to the point of shamelessness that the English importunity does not fully express. This weakens the parable argument, which is that if by shameless insistence a favor may be won, even from one unwilling and ungracious, still more surely will God answer the earnest prayer of his people. God's willingness to give exceeds our ability to ask. The parable teaches by way of contrast, not parallel. So it means that I ask, believing God will answer. Uh, I don't deserve it. Here's what I discover. When a person makes a mistake, if they were to sin or something, and they confess, they were watch this, they may, have it for a moment here. They may wait 90 days of prayer, come to church before they ask again. What I discovered, this is what God showed me. Watch, watch this right here. That by the means of grace, if I confess my sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive, that I believe that I can begin my task if I follow the uh, recommendations of the word. If I make a mistake, you make a mistake, I can say, Lord, forgive me, I'm sorry. That doesn't mean I'm on probation. I have to wait. That's the human heart. And I found the example in the book of 
I think it's Second Chronicles with Jehoshaphat. Uh, Ahab talks to him to go into war with him. He didn't really want to go. He said, but is there a prophet we can consult? Oh, yeah, there's a God, but he always got bad news all the time. But get him anyway, he says. And God tells me, he says, uh, if you go, it's not going to be good. And so I told you, he said, put him back in jail and give him just enough bread and water to eat until I get back. Guess what? Ahab never got back. Uh, Joshua almost got killed, but the, the word was out from the Assyrian army. It was the Assyrian army. Don't kill the king. He had on his priestly garments, kingly garments, and, and they saw him. They surrounded him. And, all, and he said, but he cried to the Lord. And the Lord delivered and he escaped. He, was, he goes back to Israel. And the Lord said, this is human heart. He's feeling bad. I made a mistake. And then he sends out the prophet telling me, because you're disobedient for the Lord, his cause is, basically says, his grace is upon you. you. Made a mistake, don't let worry you, God got you covered. Then Jehaziel comes. I was saying, the goes, you never know who your Jehaziel might be. Be nice to everybody. There could be a prophet with a word of deliverance for your life, but if you made it hard for them to talk to you, they're afraid to tell you. He says what? The battle is not yours, but God. Now, watch me say now, from the Pentecostal preacher, we use a text. We take one short passage and preach a major sermon. But this sermon goes two or three chapters. Yeah. Then it goes down to, and the Lord says, you should not need to fight this next battle. They go to battle, and God destroys all their enemies, and all the spoils are laid on the ground. It take them two or three days to pick up the stuff. What? He's trying to show you, I'm not mad at you. Ahab talking to doing this. You asked for a prophet. The prophet gave you a word. I delivered you, and I'm still on your side. So here God is showing him that I don't hold grudges. Let's get back to preach last, preach last Sunday. He says, uh, no grudge. Jesus got up with no grudge. Peter said, I don't know him. I have nothing to do with him. But he said, go tell the rest of the disciples what? And Peter. Uh, he's our council chairman, our vice chairman here. And I tried to follow uh, Bishop Cohn pursued his absence of Bishop Wiggins. And I had this table set here. He was sitting with, uh, um, sitting with uh, Bishop Burrell. You have comments. I'll, I'll leave you a point to have some words, expression, out of respect. If you so desire, please go up, McClendon. Bishop McClendon, God bless you, sir. Glad to have you. I'm talking today uh, about prayer. My opening scripture was, uh, let me go back and find that again for you. Um, James 4 and 2, we have not because we ask not. And uh, the point I made was that um, God is more willing to answer if we are willing to ask. Ask me, Lord, I need some help. It'll be continual prayer. Watch this. I've been mean, since 2020, when COVID hit me, it took my kidneys out. I've been asking since 2020 for God to heal me. I'm asking for a miracle or a transplant. In the meantime, I'm thanking him for the ability to function in spite of it. As I say, my affliction has lent itself to my sanctification. I don't have time for no foolishness, nothing ungodly. I've got to be focused. Everything I do, got to be focused. I had to prepare myself to be here this morning on time and rest it. I'm not mad. I'm giving God the glory, but I'm expecting a miracle from God any day. Most folks don't notice. I tell them. Because what? I go to clinic. They come in ambulatory care. They come in wheelchairs. They amputated, so they're in the hospital. I walk in, before I get relieved, I remote control my vehicle. I start my truck up, get it warm, and I walk out to it, and I drive on home. I'm blessed above measure. Yes. I'm able to have a regular life, and I, use, but I, can't, I don't have as much energy as I did. So I see the importance of much prayer, and yet my life hardly leaves room for it. Is that the, is that the norm, everybody? Is that the norm? See the importance? Do we have time for it like we ought to? Do we spend an hour? There was one occasion back in 19, I forget what year it was, I called the year of discipline. I was doing three, three times a day and studying. I said, God, how can I love you if I don't love your word? So I had to ask, God, give me your love for your words. For the words made flesh and dwell among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so then I said, God, if you're the word, how can I love you if I don't love your word? Is that, is that a reasonable question? How can you love God when you just read, when you get time, when you feel like it? So we're doing a year 
through the Bible. And a friend of mine had a, a, a bone induction headset. So they're going in your ear, it goes on either side of your ear, and I can hear everything around me and yet hear that. So I use that when I'm in clinic. I live, I'm in the book of uh, way out there now. Well, Proverbs. I'm past Proverbs, I think it is. But I listen to it. Four hours at a time. That's quite a bit of time, isn't it? To listen. But as I listen, I'm refreshed in my mind the things I've heard and the detail. My wife is going to step further than me. She decided to sit down and write the entire Bible out with a pencil on a notepad. She almost, she's almost done. So it depends on your dedication to that. Sometimes you have to ask God for that which the time we're in, we need somebody. I said earlier, those of you, some leaders are here, I says, every leader should have somebody to intercede for them. Constantly praying that God will give them the grace. Uh, so instead of complaining what they're preaching, pray for their preaching. To complain what they're teaching, pray for their teaching. Pray for their strength. Pray for their grace to be kind. Because sometimes we're under attack. We're in a day-to-day, -day, I said this, when I went to my diocese in South Africa, there was a case before I left America, I knew the witches knew I was coming. But people don't know that. They think I'm just going to South Africa. You're going to deal with some hellish stuff that's, that's meant to turn you out and turn you any kind of way to mess with you. But to come back with the grace, I, I encountered some things that was, I wasn't aware of, some of the culture. And, and in that country, if God don't answer in a hurry, guess what? They will go to the witch doctor. And there's saints that unknowingly delving in witchcraft. The ministry I did less than a few weeks, I shared again a few months or so ago called Apostolic Intercession. I was saying what our leaders need prayer. The apostolic leaders need prayer for the grace of God, for the ingenuity, for the, their mind to be invigorated. And I had a scripture I was studying recently said, and Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. I kept studying and I saw something. Help me, y'all. I saw something. It was as though God allowed Noah to see grace through the eyes of God. He didn't use a measuring stick or a yardstick to measure the, the ark. What Noah did back then is still humongous. When people say, I saw the Lord show me this land over here, this big building. I didn't see any of that. But it came to a place in my life I began to see God finishing things before they were started. And we were fitting the church out for certain matters, certain things. I said to my uh, uh, ministry of assistance, I said, why don't you go to the altar with them? We're going to pray and ask God to help us in this area. But then the week was out, the prayer was answered. He said, and a, a person in their 20s came in and gave me a $14,000 check. He said, now I believe anything. God can do anything. He can do anything. I'm asking God for healing my body. I haven't given up. I'm not frustrated. I'm not tired. He's still God. He's still supplying the grace and the energy to do it. The plan with the limitation of the energy that I have, I still get a lot done. And he gave me the heart of the saints. We went to this church last three or four months, cleaning from top to bottom, front to back, cleaning, renewing, remodeling, and somehow the Lord supplied what we needed. So, blessed be God, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. God is able to make all grace about. And I've been saying that word grace intently. I think grace means more than just grace. Now, there's the grace of God, and then there's the spirit of God. Some people have an inbred gifting from God, and God reveals it to them and accentuates it. But here's the key right here. I must remember it's for God, not for me. Some years ago, I was going to some Bishop uh, Burrell, and I was alarmed. I said, God, I can't handle this. This is too much for my mind. He said, calm down, son. This ain't going to your mind. This is going to your spirit. Yes. He says, not for you anyway. It's for me. At the time of the anointing, I'll bring it forth. Here's the problem. When God began to use people, Bishop, they think it's for them. What God did in my life is for his glory, not for my glory. Yes, and so here's the key. No matter who gets the, I say, no matter who gets the credit, as long as God gets the glory. Does that make any sense? And so, uh, all grace abound toward you that you always having what? All sufficiency, what? And all things may abound to all good work. Do let us believe that God calls to much prayer need not to be a burden and cause of continual self-condemnation. He means it to be a joy. 
So at some point, I kind of said, it almost become recreational to talk to God, to have God overflood your soul and your mind with plans and visions for your church. I talked to young men in Africa. When I first went to Africa, Bishop Earl, they said, he can't handle that. Uh, this and the other. And a childhood friend of mine called me and said, Harry, I heard you doing a good job up there in Salani. His father sent him to Harvard University. He's a lawyer. He's on the board with the Rockefellers and all these guys across the country. And he just, he been sending me, I mean, he sent me as much as $40,000 already. And one year, the whole $10,000 went to Africa. They said, let's go to church. And the next question is, how are you going to get there? Here's what you do. I'm going to send some money to get you a van. So they got together, got the rest, got a Mercedes van, 26 passenger van. So over there at Holly, nobody has a car because the income is too low. We're so blessed, we don't realize it. We're praying for more of this, more of that, a newer car, I need some new drapes, uh, I need a new outfit. And some folks don't have nothing. They wear a head rag rather than getting their hair done. And you will be better somebody else than all y'all broke, so what's the big deal? Y'all need the help of God. But I begin to realize, talk to some friends of mine across the country. I begin to realize right here in Michigan, we have Bishop R.P. Paddock, Golder, Hancock, Smith, and talk to Bishop Newman out of Arizona. He said, Ella Grayson. He said, Bishop Grayson says, on the West Coast, we didn't have access to that kind of, that kind of teaching. They didn't come this way that much. He says, as a matter of fact, Marsh Taylor made a joke out of it. He says, when I flew up your part of the country, I told the pilot, take it up 5,000 feet. <laughs> they didn't have access. And you're blessed to be in an environment with people that love the word of God, that's got to give revelation to and sharing it with us. And then there was a time and occasion we would follow him around to his hotel room. We go to Grand Rapids here and teach Bible class, then go to his hotel room. We wanted to know. That's a blessing from God, what? To want to know. So then we see he means it to be joy. He can make it an inspiration, giving us strength for all our work and bringing down his power to work through us in our fellowship, uh, fellow men. Let us not fear to admit to the full the sin that shames us and then to face it in the name of our mighty Redeemer. The light that shows us our sin and condemns us for it will show us the way. Once all the words, my feeling bad because I didn't do it will also turn around and get me inspired to do it. I'm not just ashamed because I didn't do it. Sometimes the, the, the passion grows so strong. God, show me how to pray. Yeah. Give me the desire to pray. So here we have, a, we have a team designed for this week. We're praying all in this council. God, give the preacher the help. Give the leader the help. Our leadership needs prayer. Yeah. Yeah. And I said to Brother Owens, I said, Brother Owens, I want to host this council because we need fellowship. Yeah. We need to be more loved, be drawn closer together to come at the enemy. When we're closer, he can do less division among us. Yeah. We need God to help us. Yeah. So if I'm praying, I don't need credit. All I need is satisfaction in my soul is that God has heard my prayer. Here's what happened. I got saved when I was 15 years old. I worked from the time I was 18 till now in the council. But now I'm at the place now I'm seriously considering retiring from the pastor. But I don't want to just retire. I want this work to go on to a greater level. When God dealt with Elisha, Elisha, Elisha met the, 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 the false prophets of Mount Carmel and called down fire from heaven and got discouraged and ran and hid. We are vulnerable to all that. We all, we are vulnerable. And he runs to a cave, and God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? It was basically saying, I didn't call you to be a cave, man. You were a prophet. What are you running from? He said, Lord, you understand I'm the only one. You ain't the only one. Yeah, yeah. So I got 7,000 heaven bowed their knees. So besides the fact, I got some help I've already interviewed for you, and you got to go back and get them and train them. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Because what you haven't done, they're going to do it. Everything Elijah didn't do, Elisha did it. Jehu did it. Yeah. God's work was not finished with us. We had some great men in our time. Let's be honest, but they were men of prayer, weren't they? Yeah, amen. 
We heard them praying. We heard them beseeching God in our behalf. But now we act like it's our work. It's not my work. God said to Elijah, but I speak, Elijah, it's not your ministry. It's my ministry. I called you to preach for me. Yeah. But Elisha, was that Elisha? They threw the dead man in his grave. Was that Elijah? Bible students. They threw the, the dead man in his grave. He had so much power that his bones, he anointed him, the dead man got up. Will we die with that kind of power? Will we die with a legacy? One preacher said, our legacy is not cars and houses and clothes. Our legacy is souls. The people we preached in to be saved in the work that they're doing. We taught them how to pray. We taught them how to work. Yesterday, I, re I really wanted to come yesterday. Uh, Bishop Burrell, I really wanted to come. When I got down, my feet are cold, my legs, I waited, and they didn't, they didn't warm up. But guess what? They worked so well together, they didn't need me. I got a covering blade in my lap, sat back, let my body warm up, got ready for this morning. I didn't have to be here. They did it on their own. We agreed to bring glory to God in this house and his people. And so then, uh, the light that shows us our sin and condemns us for it will show us the way out of it into the life of liberty that is well-pleasing to God. If we allow this one matter, unfaithfulness in prayer, to convict us of the lack in our Christian life which lies at the root of it, God will use the discovery to bring us not only the power to pray that we long for, but the joy of a new and healthy life in which prayer spontaneous expression. I'm going to share a point. I'm going to give it up to our, our fellow uh, pastors here. Back in the day when, you remember when uh, the internet first came out? Did the Commodore 64? Maybe I remember that one. Now, I'd be in PC Junior and had a literal floppy disk. You had no computer language to operate it. It had no memory. All it had was on that little disk. And sometimes the screen would freeze up. I'd start all over again. I'd go to bed at 8 o'clock at night. I see I was asking God for more. Go to bed at 8 o'clock at night. Wake up at midnight and study all night long. There's occasion that screen froze up and I couldn't do nothing. But the glory of God was in my soul. And I didn't mind. I'd start all over again. Cheap tat, cheap cheap tat, cheap tat, cheap tat. I studied. Back then, when I got a new computer, it was hard to transfer information from one computer to the next. Many times it was lost. Nowadays it's easy to do. I can take the, this computer right here and get it in my viewfinder, push a button, it downloads everything. God is better than that. God can take watch. I was in uh, Chicago at a, a mid one or something one time, and I lost my wallet. I tried to find it. Down. They said the, the lost and found was down in McCormick Center. I walked past a place. They had the cardiology convention was there. You know, all the updates of medicine and heart research. I was amazed how scientists share openly and freely information for better care for the patients of this country. But in salvation, we hide information. I'm going to share this because this is my next sermon. I want to no, preach my notes. No, this, those are not my notes. Those are God's notes. Things he gave to edify the church and build them up. But it's the scriptures of no private interpretation. He didn't save me to be a star. He saved me to be a servant. To share. You see them serving big convention halls. They all walk in at the same time. They tray on their hand. Serving, and, they, and when they get to the table, they all sit at their plate at the same time. There's no stars in Jesus. This is his program. This is his church. And we're to pray for leaders that God would teach them how to edify this body, to build a spirituality. This occasion, uh, I can see Sunday morning before I get here. I see what God going to do, who he's going to do it through, who to use. And a friend of mine said, man, you never asked me to preach at your church. I said, well, be honest with you, the Lord never gave me your name. I don't, I don't, they ain't good enough for me. I said, I know it's good enough for you. I said, this friend of mine said, I invited to preach and I paid them well. They never invited me, but I ain't mad. But I don't, I don't think you said, well, if they ain't good enough for you, I got nothing to tell you. I'm sorry. Bye. This is, the, this is God's church. And some of you in a place that only God knows where you're at. We've got to be people of prayer. 
And so then, and what is now that the way by which our senses of the lack of prayer can be made the means of blessing, the interest on a path in which the evil may be conquered? How can our intercourse with the Lord in continual prayer and intercession become what it ought to be? We need the world around us are to be blessed. I'll pause a moment to talk about uh, to our other pastors and bishops that are here. Uh, just for a moment, uh, Bishop Come normally giving words. I'm trying to follow this, this format he uses in regard. Um, just for a moment to give us some expressions. And today I say, uh, we are in, we're in grave danger. I'll say this right here. We're in grave danger. Uh, if we don't recognize how much we need each other, but to pray for another. Um, last Saturday, Ella Lamar, um, I went to breakfast early in the morning. I was going to come to the funeral. It was wet. It was cold. I told a young person I talked to, him, I said, he says, you've never been old before. Bishop Singleton said me one time, Bishop uh, Burrell. He said, I was Grayson, man, I was talking to a young person. I said, how you doing, Bishop? He said, if I told you, you wouldn't understand. So I've been young, but you ain't never been old. If certain things go along with being old, it's not young folks can't understand. And the smile on my face is not a babysitting smile. <laughs> it's me, my arthritis says, it's left me for a moment. My bad knee ain't twitching no more. <laughs> and I ain't struggling for, for air. It's, it's, a, it's a good moment. I don't mean I'm like all of that. Sometimes we need God to help us. So I'm getting to the point on with Elman Lamar. I went home, I says, do I really feel like going? I called my wife, he's down in Georgia. She said, honey, you need to go. There's too many people you know out there support them. You're too close. You need to get up and go to that funeral. You know what I did? I got up. <laughs> I called her brother. I said, brother Betts, I said, I need, I don't mean to be Thank you for granted, but I need you to help bring me a ride. Because it's hard for me sometimes to get a ride out to Belleville. And we told I'm doing six, five miles an hour. It's going out your way. And that something police passed me, stop and turn around. Oh, Lord, here we go. I got to the church park lot. He drove on by and left. He said, the grace of God is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what happened right here in the lesson. You know, the scriptural knowledge means spiritual one too, but there has to be a love for people. Sometimes people are hard to love, but in the, the gifts of the Spirit, you've got to have the love of God. You can't just have a gift and a gift by a gift by itself. You can't have one of the Beatitudes without a part of all the Beatitudes. And when I got there, uh, the body was leaving, I had to go in anyway. Now I want you to see my face. I did try. Because what? There's my brother. In my body, I was feeling a certain kind of way because my thing don't come and go once or twice a week. It's all the time. I get two days. That's Tuesday and Thursday. Two days off to feel normal. Any other day, if I go in there, I feel terrible. I went to Charleston, South Carolina the other week to Bishop Board meeting, and I skipped the day of dialysis. I wanted to go and feel normal. So not like a regular old person. Old folks, I got to feel y'all in here, right or wrong. I was young once. I'm still young. I, I, like I don't like being around old folks. They talk about that medication and pain. Let's not talk about that not right now. But God is to teach us how to pray for one another. And through our prayers, I may see your ministry grow, but I can't take the credit for that. Because God gave the assignment. I'm looking for God's hand to show up and his grace on your life. The Lord really bless him. Say, amen. Just leave it like that. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Because God told you to pray. You didn't pray because you saw the need to pray. God told you to pray. That is nothing I've seen this lesson right here. I'm going to pause right now. I'm going to ask Bishop Burrell. Um, I discovered a word that I look at. It was the word ego. Ego is one of those terms came from, you know, how many of y'all know who Sigmund Freud is? He's kind of a sick old guy, but he was the original one this time. Comfort. Or modern day psychology. I think we as men are more vulnerable than women are to ego. We want recognition, we want credit, we want our name called out. If I don't call your name God, it's still God. The Holy Ghost is still powerful. 
And you don't need me to know you. I've been a pooping. People say things to me to meant to shut me down. One guy said, don't take long. I got done. I said, was that long enough for you? And church is going crazy. But it's not about that. It's about God being glorified. And God choose who he will. So I'm saying to you, the, the, the layman out there, we need you all to pray for the ministry. We are in a spiritual attack. But the devil is alive. I went to the gates of hell. I almost died. I woke up and I was planning my funeral. And again, my wife talked me out of it. I said, your, I said, your mother, she left it, and she was doing good. I said, but honey, she was 90. You ain't 90. <laughs> when you come that close to death, you get this, it, something hits you emotionally. You fought hard to get to that place. And so you ready to say, let's, let's, let's go and cross that river. Lord said, not now. But it wasn't easy saying that. Now I had to go through rehab. I had to learn how to walk again. I couldn't even walk. They had to feed me and wash. It's humiliating. My, my children nursed me. They cared for me. And nursed me. I didn't just get up on my own and say, God is good. It took a determination to survive. Some people are trying their best to survive, and somebody's got to pray. It ain't that easy. Good suit don't make you look good. I had, a, I had a brand new suit I had bought, I had a custom made, and I, I was going to wear that to my own funeral. And Lord said, not now. Lost 50 some pounds, had to retail it again because I was too, too little for it. I lost, I lost diabetes. It's gone. So when I, as sick as I was, I got better when I got out. My God. God can take you through the fires of hell and come out with no smoke in your clothes. Come on, somebody. It ain't like marijuana. Everybody around you know be smoking. <laughs> but God can bring you out. He can deliver you. And even the world can tell. They said, these men have been with God. How many of us, how many of us have been with God? And Lord said, you, he told me one time, he said, you can't get up until deliverance comes. What's for me for somebody? Give me, he gave me an assignment. You, you can't stop because they're still in trouble. Stay there. The prayer means over. I know, but you can't get up. They're still in trouble. Trouble don't have time periods to it. Trouble can last for years. It's been since 2020. It's been going through medical procedures every three days a week. The needle is bigger than a drinking straw in my arm. But to God be the glory. Um, I'm going to talk now. I'm going to pause a moment. And Bishop Burrell, if you would, please, sir. Uh, uh, I would, I'm going to say where God's giving is inseparably connected with our asking. Not just thinking it. Lord, I need some help. No, oh God. I found a scripture, Mr. Uh, Burrell, particularly with Daniel. Things are so bad, Daniel had to repent for the whole nation. Sometimes God help, we pray, we have to repent for everybody. Lord, forgive the NDC. Forgive the PAW. God help us. It's not about you. The work of God can grow so big so fast, you're more concerned about keeping the lights on, the furnace running, the carpet clean. You forgot about the people of God. Let's have the book of Acts, the eighth chapter. The apostle, I have a friend of mine, he's a former superintendent of Cleveland schools, he had a billion dollar budget, thousands of people on the staff. He's retired, but he's still highly disciplined. If I call him, he may not answer the phone. I understand it, because he's a disciplined person. He may want to talk. When we get to talking, he may go on for an hour just talking. When you, have, when you focus on what you want, he thinks, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. You be so determined that it's prayer time, I got to go. Oh, my wife, if she really like you, she'll go to bed on you. <laughs> she going to bed on the cover and she sleeps. She really like you. Ain't that an insult? She like you. So she go to bed. 
when you really want to an answer from God, and your church that you may not be happy with may be tired to your praying for your pastor. He's under attack. His peace of mind. His family. I said before, I began to think about it. I said, I don't remember. I had my grandson. He's about nine weeks old. He's so fragile, so small. I said, my wife, I don't remember holding on children. I said, look, I was repenting, feeling kind of bad. I thought about it again, but God helped me. All those years, he helped me. He watched over them. He kept them. Kept them out of jail. Kept them being shot in sickness and disease. So I can't complain. Well, I did his work. He took care of mine. Maybe I couldn't do anything else everybody else did, but I did enough. They called me. How you doing, Dad? I called Chuck. Are you all right? I'm fine, honey. I think you appreciate it. Make sure you're all right. I'm all right, dear. They know, your family know what you're going through. It's a blessing to have a companion that prays as well. Every leader, I implore you, if you don't have it already, find somebody that wants you to call my name out in prayer. If you're a preacher, think you're a good preacher, you need somebody to pray for you. The enemy is trying to disrupt the operation of the church. It's not on how good you look, how good you preach. God has to help you. Please, sir. Please, sir. Microphone, please. Testing. Praise the Lord, everyone. Put your hands together. Isn't God good? Amen. We've been enjoying the uh, word of the Lord. Uh, on this morning uh, in this uh, minister session, and we certainly uh, reverence our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, who's the head of our life and the head of the uh, church, the body of Christ, and certainly we give great honor even to our diocesan, uh, the Honorable Bishop Ira Combs, Jr., uh, in his absence, and certainly to our host pastor, uh, the Honorable uh, Bishop Harry Grayson. Uh, can you say man uh, who is uh, ministering to us at this uh, present time concerning uh, the yielding uh, to the grace of God, which each and every one of us uh, should have the humility um, to be able to uh, yield uh, to the grace that God gives to all of us and to our council chairman, the Honorable Suffolk Bishop. To Ryan Wiggins and to uh, Vice Chairman, who is here, the Honorable Suffolk and Bishop Luke McClendon, and uh, all of you, the ministers of the saints of the Most High God. It is good for us to be here. And uh, as he was teaching, um, something came to my mind because um, when he was talking about the blessing of uh, technology. And on yesterday evening, the young lady that preached, she was uh, talking about the advantage in using the flip Bible or having a, a Bible Bible rather than uh, using uh, the Bible on uh, a phone or something like that. And in your flipping through the scriptures, she was saying that... Uh, you go through and you see other scriptures and it's it's uh, much more beneficial trying to find a scripture with a flip bible than it is just uh, on uh, a phone or ipad or something uh, where you can just go to it and and then bishop grayson was talking about the blessing of technology and how god has uh, taken us to a place now uh, where we can go higher. We can do things uh, at a different level than we've ever been able to do before. And so this brings into the picture the importance of um, millennials in the church. Uh, and um, they have a lot of knowledge and wisdom uh, when it comes down to 
the technology of today and uh, we're blessed in our churches to have young people um, that are willing to uh, serve and to work with leadership, uh, work with the pastor, uh, uh, to do the things that need to be done so that we can be competitive um, in this society that we're living in now. Uh, it's it's very competitive, uh, whether you know it or not. Uh, parents are are dealing with so many different things, trying to just keep their children and their grandchildren um, in church, around church, because you're competing with the internet, you're competing with all these other things. And so the Lord brought this scripture to my mind, Job 32 and 8. Um, but there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the almighty giveth them wisdom but there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the almighty giveth them understanding and this scripture alludes to the fact that it is God that gives the understanding. It is God that gives the wisdom to the doctors to be able to do what they do. It was God that allowed us to have the internet. Can the church say amen? amen. It is a spirit in man but it is God that gives man the understanding to be able to do the things that man does. We don't understand electricity. Even the electrician only understands a certain amount about electricity um, uh, because uh, God allows man to have that understanding. And I can remember when uh, we first got our first television, and Bishop Grayson, he's been saved longer than me. He said he got saved at 15, I got saved at 20. Uh, and I know he's been married more than 50 years. 51 because um, my, my oldest brother and I were partying at University of Michigan. It, was, it had been a Michigan State and a Michigan uh, football game and uh, no it was basketball and it was in the winter time and our car radiator had overheated we put water in it instead of antifreeze and it froze up and when we come out of the party our car wouldn't start so my father calls Elder Ross and Elder Ross calls Bishop Grayson and Bishop Grayson maneuver things um, where um, we could get our car in a heated garage overnight or so it, it, the radiator would thaw out and then we stayed in uh, Bishop Grayson's home and I think you all were really newly married so I know he's been married uh, and he's been uh, saved longer than me because I was sure enough wasn't saved back then <laughs> but I, I'll be, say, 50 years in June of this year. So uh, we go, uh, Bishop Grayson and I, we go way back. Uh, but he's always been one that allowed God to use him even in technology. And uh, he always had things that nobody else had. <laughs> And I always admired that about uh, uh, him because uh, uh, he, he was a student that way. And he realized that God had given us these things. I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> that God had given us these things to accentuate us, to help us, uh, to make us better. Um, and uh, this inspiration comes from God, the understanding uh, for them to come up with these things. It comes from God. And this is going to be 
used by God right to the end. Even after the rapture of the church, even after uh, the millennium, and during the tribulation period, when Moses and Elias, the two witnesses, according to Revelation 11, um, uh, when they're killed and they're lying in the streets of the city, the great city Jerusalem, called, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, and the peoples and the tongues and kindreds and tongues and nations, it says, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. How is the whole world going to see those dead bodies? Through technology. And it says, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and a great fear fell upon them who saw them. How did the whole world see them resurrected? Through technology. So God uses that. And so that, that's a positive thing. Uh, we know about all the negative things. I think the uh, women had a thing yesterday, uh, and I, I wasn't in person for that session, but I did view it. Uh, it was streamed on the effects of social media, uh, particularly on young people uh, and so forth. Uh, but God wants us to channel uh, all of that in positive ways for us to be able to build the kingdom of God. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Bishop, for giving me a space. Yeah. Uh, oh, and that's up again. Channel uh, testing. One, two, two, three, four, five. I recognize, watch this, Bishop Burrell. The more you go out there, the more you have to bear criticism. Take your simple words, they magnify them. Criticize them. Uh, you need uh, another whole staff to manage your presence in social media. Uh, I think it's good, but I only go so far. I don't have time to deal with a lot of foolishness. It seems in my hands on the other man right here, praying for me. They say, We in love. The Bible said, for son David and Solomon and Joshua, well, David and Paul's son, Jonathan, was stronger than that love of a woman. But they weren't gay. I'm saying, but social media can pervert stuff. And I don't like going everywhere to everything either. I see, you don't know what people are going to say to you. I, I believe that, that the whole world is going to see it. The Lord is using social media. But I started with an interest in social media in 68 or so, I saw what they were paying the IT guy, and I want to get paid like that. <laughs> so I started my interest back then. It wasn't for the sake of helping the kingdom. <laughs> it was helping me in my house. <laughs> and I'm getting saved, so. But yeah, it is, it's a different day. And we'd be careful, watch, not to believe everything you hear. A lot of people fabricate stuff. And it can go a long time, but the way you outdo it, you gotta outlive it. People said things about me were nasty. And the Holy Ghost said to me, Don't touch, I'm gonna show you something. I sat down and endured, and before it's over, the Lord dealt with it in a very strong way. I read the Old Testament, God was chopping heads, running spirits through the fifth rib. I don't know what the fifth rib must be supposed to heart or something. God was killing people. They came out as slaves and ended up being warriors. God took great vengeance. From those that attacked his people. So you said, we all went through changes in life. We, we grew, didn't we? Yeah. Little by little, piece by piece. We just opening doors and putting down chairs. I'll leave it to uh, Bishop Wiggins, please, sir. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Amen. Certainly we give honor to uh, Bishop uh, 
Combs in his absence, and certainly to our host, uh, Bishop, Bishop Grayson, so graciously let us come into the house here at Messiah, and they're doing such a great job. Uh, I thank God for his teaching. Thank God for the great men and women of God and all that is said. Uh, yielding is, is extremely important. Uh, as uh, That's really the basic principles of our life in Christ is yielding. And I learned it at a, uh, a young age, even with my brothers. I had big, big, strong brothers, twice as big as I am. And I learned the lesson of yielding. Uh, my brother Mac, I mean, he had hands almost 12 inches long. And, and when he grabbed you, you know, uh, I had the notion to try to fight him back. That was the wrong thing to do. And he would just tear me asunder. But it wasn't until I yielded <laughs> when he grabbed me, just, just my whole body had to go limp. And that's when he gave me grace and mercy. But if I kept fighting, then I got a worse whooping than I, than I thought I had. So that, that was my first time understanding about yielding. And I had to yield, yield to God. I had to yield to God even in my profession, uh, thinking uh, I don't care how many stripes they put on your sleeve and all that. Uh, it is of God. God has to protect us. And until, until you yield to the spirit of God, hallelujah. Uh, that's when God will bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, make it short and sweet, please. Go ahead. 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 In the human psyche, our capacity is greater than we demand. I discovered many years ago, a person that is blind, hearing is substantially greater than ours, only because they need it. They don't have sight. So I learned to start using my senses more than I realized. And she knew I was in a mechanical engineering and refrigeration, so I could walk in a room and hear the ice cracking. I knew it was frozen. I learned how to use. So what with God, and the scripture in Hebrew says, at the time you ought to be eating meat, you have need of milk. Not having your senses exercised therein too. Sometimes we have to ask God to heighten our senses. And they say, and the, they say, and the internet never forgets. What you put out there stays out there. You can't say I didn't mean that. No, you said it and it's out there. I'm talking about now this thing about uh, uh, the grace of yielding, the measure of spiritual strength I'm talking about for a moment. Uh, let's, I want you to examine in regard to this topic, it's found in Romans 15 and 1. We then are strong, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So I believe the scriptural mark of strength it's not how much you can do, but rather how much you can bear of the weakness of others. Sometimes a person may not ask you to pray for them, but you can sense the need of prayer. One occasion at church, right outside his door out here, one summer's real bright sunny day. Brother has some real dark glasses. He says, how you doing? He said, I'm fine. Are you sure? And tears begin to run. Does anybody care enough to ask? Does anybody care enough to inquire? People are watching us, how we care for one another. 
Sometimes they know some of us going through stuff we shouldn't be going through because we should have more concern. I learned this right. Some people think in classes, you're somebody, you're nobody. You're rich and you're poor. You're smart or you're dumb. That's not the case. This is called the land of opportunity. You can change all of that. You can grow. You become better. Even being a saint. The army said, be all that you can be. The Lord says, be more than you can be. And when, and when you start changing, huh, you trying to be something you ain't. You got that right. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm trying to be like y'all. I'm trying to be like him. So we think a strain a person begins to ascend. What I learned is, I know Ella Johnson for a long time, I learned to act dumb. I'm, some folks like being smart. Go on, be smart. Go on, be smart. Go on, know it all. I don't care. But I became a pastor. I can't do that no more. The Bible don't say that. That's not right. I said to one of the brothers I talked to, I'm trying to train him, I says, y'all choose names, I choose character. We would better have a two people we like what we know. But are they faithful? I'm going to give you a point. Uh, uh, I call it the fat man principle. You know, you know what that is, fat man principle? Faithful, available, and teachable. They're faithful and available, but you can't tell them nothing. Remember that. It's good for any leader to remember the fat man principle. I choose character, not names. But brother so so let me think about that for a minute. I'm not going against them. What happened, the enemy is going to eat him alive. But she had a point here. A guy said, his pastor told him, says, son, the Lord is going, I say, break you. He thought he was going to say something deep. That's what Taylor wants to share with you. And then the trouble started. People started turning on him. Things broke apart. His lifelong friends, they broke up. His mentor, he had a challenge him with something he saw that wasn't right. And the man, they, they fell out. The man left the room storming. And a week later, the man's wife called and said, get over here in a hurry. He had hung himself in the garage. The pain of leadership. And so this is where you measure strength. Can you bear the infirmities of the weak? They say, hurting people hurt people. People say things meant to hurt me, and it hurt. But I can't let it, I can't let it stop me. My assignment is to help them. Because I got to figure out how to get close enough to help them. Sometimes people hurt something, but it does require spiritual strength to bear the weakness of others. I believe that spiritual strength is measured by God and by the scriptures in proportion to the amount that we're able to support and bear the weakness of other people. For me personally, that was never been easy. People can come at you, they expect things out of you, and I said to one person, are you a psychic or something? You reading people's mind? I never even thought what you're saying. I wasn't even aware of that problem. They think you know, but they don't understand. Uh, what says, as, a, as, as, a, as a pastor of a church, a vice chairman of the things you do, you do more than just church, right or wrong. And the more gifted you are, the more people are going to call on you to help them. I said to a person, I handle stuff in Africa, besides the Messiah's Temple. I work with legislators, a congressmen, and senators. I work with all kinds of people. But I don't bring it to this the other arena. I just do it and leave that there. So the key is the bearded of the week is not just here in the church, but I say, if your church were to move from your community and nobody miss you, you ain't doing your job. Your community should feel the impact of your absence. Are you ministering to the people that God has given you? Or do you walk over them every Sunday to get in your door? Or do you invite them in? And so one of the outstanding marks of Christians in the first century was that they cared for the weak. They did it intuitively. They fed Paul. Paul would ask for help for the churches, and some churches were poor, but they gave abundantly. And Paul commended them for their care, saying that you wouldn't want yourself, but you gave to help. So right now, watch. We have a number of pastors here. Uh, I hope I don't cross the line here. But do you ever feel like you're by yourself sometimes? You know, y'all feel y'all all y'all right? We wish we had some help, some fellowship. There's things God has given me. I want somebody to talk it out. It was like a marble in my head. It's rolling around, I gotta get it out. I need to talk to somebody about what God just gave me. 
Who can you talk to about it? Who even studies on that level? Who prays on that level? Who's concerned enough to carry those kind of matters? Some of you as parents are carrying things, because our kids are some, kids today, mom, our kids are in their mid-30s. They still need prayer and help sometimes. I feel an honor to help them because they're my child. I helped so many people. I loaned so much money out. I was glad to help them until I went broke. <laughs> I didn't broke, broke them wrong. My cash app is where I help people from. I do it graciously because I helped a lot of people. It's an honor, would you agree? But I found out it's never going to stop unless they get a job better than you and everybody else. The greatest honor when your kids come take you to dinner and pay your house note for you. And so we see here then, uh, uh, we did to deny ourselves. Uh, that's, that's, that's yielding, to deny ourselves and ask God to help others. In 1 Corinthians one twenty five, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And there was one thing in which the weakness and the foolishness of God found their full expression. What was that? It was the cross. And both the weakness and the foolishness of the cross, God triumphed over all the strength and all the wisdom of this world. Everything we need, God has the ability by his grace and spirit. Now, I didn't intend to the word grace. There's grace for all kinds of issues. Grace is not just grace, grace. There's, what's it, Brother, Brother Johnson? There's grace for being a good companion. Extenuating circumstance, but God gives you the grace to be loving anyway. There's grace as a pastor. I say four. The determining factor in being a great leader is not your teaching ability or your preaching ability, it's your ability to handle pain. You do it and keep blessing God. Do it and still kind. And so then, but God has shown uh, me that my strength and my personality will only take me so far. If I wish I can stop there, but I am not compelled to go any further, but I have seen many lives and ministries stop at that point. That's all I want. I don't want no more. But God wants more than you have to offer. And by his grace, he enables us through prayer. It could be a season of time. This time, I, I, I will pray all night long. But now I can lay there in a chair and think about it. I can't pray with a passion and fervency because that's you. My wife would say, honey, what did he say today? You don't ask me that no more. You know why? Because I ain't, I ain't wailing no more. <laughs> I ain't hollering no more. I said, oh, Lord, in the name of Jesus, help me, Lord. Give me grace. Oh, God, help me. And so what happened is, she would say, honey, are you going to church tonight to pray? on Saturday night. But she learned eventually that I can turn the pages and never open a book. Because the word is now in you. God can speak to you. He can, you're turning chapters and pages and never to lay down, oh, use your Bible? Well, I carried a Bible until I couldn't read the letters no more. The bigger print I got, the bigger the Bible got. And pretty soon my Bible looked like a family Bible. <laughs> So I got bifocals and got a computer. I can lodge that well. But it is easier. I say on occasion, I have a thing called Kindle. My, I have an electronic library with tens of thousands of dollars in books in it. I mean, how many books I add, it never gets any heavier. I use it for study. I don't hear it as a show. I use it as study. And so then we find Romans 8 and 9 that, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Now, this verse is strangely constructed. It's just of two distinct sentences. Uh, and here's our study. I just sometimes study it intently. Go back to Romans and study it in Scripture in Galatians 2 and 20. Probably Galatians 2 and 20. I'm going to show you something. Galatians 2 and 20. The one thing now, let's say Romans 5 and 1. Um, what does Romans 5 and 1 say? Uh, what? Uh, Mike, read it for me, please. Romans 5 and 1. We'll go back to Galatians 2 and 20. Now, 
peace with God is doctrinal. The peace of God is experiential. The peace with God comes through water baptism and the spirit when the offense that was got with God through the disobedience of Adam has been removed, we have peace with God. The peace of God comes through a life of walking with God, his word growing in us through a prayer life and reading and walk with God. We are now in a place we have what? Please God. One is doctrinal, one is experiential. The Galatians 20, 20, what does that say? The life I now live, right? Is that what it says? Yeah, please read it. I went through a, a number of passages that came to that step when it says it best. Out of Romans, uh, we read here, 8 and 9. But the spirit, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, it shall be the spirit of God dwelling in you. Now, the spirit of God and Christ are the same, but the spirit of Christ is the manifestation of the life of Christ in us. To the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Nevertheless, not I. What? The Christ lived within me. So when God sent back the Holy Ghost, it was enough to deliver us from sin, but the Spirit of Christ is that part that gives us the desire to fulfill those intricate pieces that makes it so that his life can be manifest in us. Not only to the church, to the world. God can show you how to dispense grace. That the power of God is such in your life, you can dispense it. How oh, you dispense it? One way, right? I'm in a store, and my goal is now to share grace, joy. Uh, I said the young lady says, your hair looks nice. She said, oh, oh, thank you. She didn't recognize it. Say something nice about them to make them bring them out of the dumps. One guy told us someone went to the lady's house, and she was real nasty, but he was nice nevertheless. Keep on talking. She calmed down. She said, and she invited a man. So he walked in the house with a gun by the door. So, oh, I was getting ready to kill myself. But with your kindness, I changed my mind. Come on in. Have you changed anybody's mind? Have you spoke to someone who's ready to leave the church and says, I think I'll stay? I teach a saint to you that says, when the council comes, you will be kind to everybody. You don't know what people are going through. I mean, be encouraged, be kind to them, be inviting, be gracious unto them. And so, I don't wish to suggest more that there is any kind of division between these two, but I do believe that there's a difference in the way they represent the nature of God. Um, one scripture, I have it somewhere. If we are to ask my, uh, if I were to ask myself what the spirit of Christ is like, I would have to say it is a mixed spirit, is a humble spirit, is a gentle spirit, is certainly not arrogant, self-assertive, or self-pleasing. And I believe is what marks the true child of God, the spirit of Christ. So our goals and whatever we meet is to be kind, would you agree, and gentle. You're going to meet some sharp people that have something bad, especially, it could be a police officer, uh, a guy whose wife just told before he came on duty, she wants a divorce. Or find out she's unfaithful. Well, guess what? If you're the person that stops, you're going to catch it. But how do you diffuse that? How do you deal with that? God is able to intervene. I think last Saturday, I went to the funeral. I was doing 65 miles an hour in a 45 zone. I was getting it, trying to get to church on time. The police turned around and came back at me. He must have ran my place. He must have said, say, leave him alone or something. Because <laughs> he didn't stop me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God for the grace of God. Amen. But do you know that in God's sight, you don't prosper by asserting your rights? Amen. As a leader, if they call me bishop or elder, reverend, I don't care. I tell people when I hear my name, guess what? It reminds me my mama loved me because she gave me my name. And I'm not ashamed of my name. I asked, I said, I said, Mom, did my name have anything to do with President Truman? Because he's going to the office at the same time. She said, it had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but, but she, but she gave me my name, thank God, for my name. I ain't ashamed of because you call me by my name. I know who I am. The rest of it, God is making known. And when we get to heaven, I pray God will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so your strength is not what you have or what you 
can demonstrate, but rather your strength is the ability to bear the infirmities of the weak. Now, the spirit of Christ is a spirit that freely yields. Indeed, I believe that he is the supreme example of yielding. It is or it's just this aspect of his conduct that most clearly marked the difference between him and Satan. Philippians 2 and 6, what? Who being in the form of God, but not brought to be equal with God. This is what King James says, but the New American Standard Bible says he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. The point being here, uh, the human ego is a complex psychological concept that involves a person's sense of self, identity, and individuality. It encompasses one's self-esteem, self-importance, and self-image. The purpose of the ego is to help individuals navigate the world, interact with others, and protect their sense of self-worth. It can also drive motivation, ambition, and the pursuit of personal goals. However, an unchecked or inflated ego can lead to negative behaviors such as arrogance, selfishness, and a lack of empathy. Uh, balancing a healthy ego with humanity and empathy is important for personal growth and healthy relationships. So then, as a pastor and leader, it's important I put my ego in check. I'm the pastor of the church. I ain't having that around here. I'm running things now. This is the church of the living God. We exercise authority by being an example. Now, I do, the time I meant to do certain things, say something, but that's not my demeanor, exercising authority. Amen? I don't tell my wife to come on. I'm at home. She don't call me pastor. She call me bishop. She may call me honey. She may call me dear. She may just call me. But I do answer. Amen? And so we thank God that I don't have to assert that. To get that. It's a blessing to have compassion and love. Amen? You ain't got to put your fist down on the table. So I'm the head of this house. I'm the head of this house because what? Uh, I do pay the bills, but I don't brag about it. They do, I just pay them. Put most all my stuff on my phone. I pay my house note, car note, everything from my phone. I just pay it. My wife, I say, hey, honey, I say, you need a break. I say, well, get you a ticket and go to, go to Georgia. She got my credit card and she went. So that's all right with me. And when God saved me, his ultimate goal is that I be able to exercise according to his word. If I become aware of what his word says, walk in agreement with his word, that he will honor the rest of it. Amen? Yes. When Israel came along in the Old Testament, they had a whole lot of enemies. And God was checking them left and right. Some gave Israel the, the, the authority and the power to overcome them. Some kings came against Israel they should not have. And God gave them the power overcome every enemy. And what I say to the preachers, watch this. They said, man, that's a Baptist stronghold. They got that city under control. No, God can give you a heavenly breakthrough through prayer. Amen. And Nip Slanty was a bit of a Baptist stronghold, but the Lord gave us presence, the ability to interact. I work with those guys. I don't go so far. I work with them. I befriended them. Uh, I said, like an African, you know, Johannesburg, uh, the, the Zulus are like the Baptists. They will stick together, whatever the case is. And they will, you have a church on jam full of Zulus and a few other folks as well. But you say they're full gospel Baptists, they will come. But the Lord gave us a breakthrough to where souls are getting saved and respect them. People going to went to that Baptist church, drove in that parking lot, said, Lord, let me here, and I want to be saved. God can give you a breakthrough. He can take you from poverty to wealth because the hand of God is on your life. It's on your church, on your ministry. I tell the uh, a pastor there in Africa, I walk with him, I says, at a certain level, I can give you money, that's fine. At a certain level, you got to start making financial reports. You can't just take money and run with it. I told Brother Ryan, so I sent him a financial statement. Well, he said, I don't remember all this. I said, well, I didn't just make it up. I got the receipts to prove you what I gave you. At a certain point, to be blessed, you got to keep track of what God gave you. The government, they call, they call it seed money. They're giving you $500,000 just to test you out. But you can't handle money and hide it in your purse and in your mattress, not giving accountability to it. God wants to know how you handle it in a business-like manner. 
and money will come to you. Grace will follow you. When God began to bless you, people going to put one. Is that Tyler Perry? Did Mr. Jackson a million dollars? Tyler Perry laid his hands on anointing him. Say, you want me to anoint me? If he gave me a million, he could lay his hands on me too. They ain't taking nothing from you, right or wrong. Ain't they taking nothing from you? Lay your hands. Put the check right there. Or put, it, put it on, put it right here. We have some issues that really not issues. Something when God wants to do it, he'll bless you when he wants to bless you. Amen? And so then, uh, let me go a little further here my lesson. You've got to be willing to yield. you got to want God. So God, uh, we talked about earlier, I think Mr. Burrow said something. And I said to God, I said, God, tell me what you want. Life is too short to be fighting God. You want it like this? You want it like this? On my face? On my back? Tell me, so I can help me give it to you and get on back to life. So now we spend years fighting over stuff that don't make no sense. That was with our personal life. There's been an occasion I was on the way to Briarwood Mall. A sunny day, the sun was shining, the sunroof open, the rain was blowing, but it felt good. And the Holy Ghost said, Go home. I want to talk to you. I turned around, took a feeling brought back, spent the next few weeks at home, the presence of God, getting instruction. Something God got to say is not just a word, it's a detailed instruction. What God has for you and your church require detailed instruction. Who to get? How to get? When I needed some things in the church here, the Lord told me how to ask. Somebody sent me a post where he said that. Jamal Bryant said that some rabbi told him, quit asking for tithes. He said, what? Yeah. And teach the people how to budget. I did Every year I do a Bible class called Budgeting the Tithe. Some of you can't tie, you're being, being garnished, alimony, child support, government, or whatever it is. Now I gave him a plan and said it worked, just like you said. If you can't got no money, or no money to give it all, be consistent with what you give. In two weeks' time, they got a raise, they got a promotion. God said, in order for me to bless this church, I got to bless the members. God said, you're going to bless your life in order to bless this church. It began to happen. My left, we get say about people leaving. People leave. People are going to leave. Look to me, I saved them to be a part of this ministry. But they chose something different. That's on them. But this is my church. This is my plan. I'm supporting. Guess what? And the money stopped coming in again. We put in that $20,000 sign. We had to be, be updated. We over $100,000 last few months. And God sent the money in to support his vision. Not my vision, it's God's vision. And so then we find here that Solomon, he asked for wisdom. He said, give me an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. First Kings 3 and 9. God was pleased with his choice and said, because thou hast asked this thing, I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor. Now I call that a, a, a hypothesis. Anybody know what a hypothesis is? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scientific term. You'll find the right question that addresses all issues in one question. One old man who died a billionaire, he said, Brother Harry, I go to bed with questions and I wake up with answers. I go to bed with a th right mind and thinking and meditation. Somewhere in the midnight hour, the Lord gives me the question to ask. I wake up and I go to the computer. I type in the question and all the answers are. I got to figure out which one fits the best scenario what I'm dealing with. Well, sometimes the Lord sends people into my life to help me. We all need help. God send me the help that I need. Here's what happens. Some of you have a grace in your life to do more than most people can do. But they doing all that. You won't help them. 
I found the back in the scripture, it was with Elijah and with Jonah. Jonah was running from, with Jonah, but Elijah particularly, Elijah was running from Jezebel. The angel woke him up with some food and a drink. He said, the journey is too great for thee. Here's the one that gave me out of that, that scenario. When people ought to help you and don't help you, God will send somebody or supernatural he'll help you. They refuse to help you. It is, they, they talk about you because the grace is on your life. Elijah doing some crazy stuff, calling down fire from heaven with several barrels of water in the time of a drought. Where did he get the water from? Yeah, say meet me on Mount Carmel. Now, he's not even there, but he's telling them to meet him, and also, God's going to meet him there. Anybody here got a Mount Carmel? You want to meet God at today? Anybody need a miracle today? And Elijah said, as the Lord God liveth for whom I stand, by the word of my mouth. Yeah. Anybody, got that, that, anybody got that kind of relationship that can call God out and God says, I heard you, I'll be right there. That's what happens. God wants somebody to call him to his showdown and the shootout. Y'all yeah. having church, that's good. But God said, I want my power to be revealed in the earth today. Satan getting wild. He getting nasty and he getting jiggy. <laughs> he danced on the front porch of the church. The devil lives a lie. People are on an internet every time and occasion. And the holiness, it was, a, it, was a, it was a mockery to have drums in a Baptist church. They heard our drummers, our organists, and they all over the internet shouting. But God said, I want to show my power in the house of my people. Watch, we got some great preachers. We got some, we got some of the greatest preachers in the world. Last year, I sent a group to South Africa. The doctor forbade me to go because of my condition. But I didn't stop me. I get a plan. I called uh, Ryan, a team. How many people was it? LR, LR, how many people was it? About 12 people went. And uh, Bishop Thornton, who got saved in 1980-something. He said, Bella Grace, I walked past the sanctuary when I was a kid. And I used my hollering, more grace, Lord. More grace than it was you in the hollering, more grace. I was going through the fire. So Bishop Thorne, here's the Lord gave me about Africa. We talked for two hours. When he finished, he came and laid down before me. I laid my hands like Jesus with the sent the apostles out. I laid my hands on him and conferred on him the grace that God had put on my life. And went to Africa in three days, 55 got the Holy Ghost and 37 got baptized. Here's the key right here. As we get older, it ain't got to be us. It don't have to be us. But Lord, give me a Timothy. Give me someone I can lay my hands on who will sit. And one preacher said, you don't get somebody's mantle by them laying your hands on them. You get their mantle by serving them. You got to serve somebody. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, I learned this right. I don't care how good you are, everybody has a bad day. I guarantee y'all, all y'all in here have had a bad day. If you say you didn't, you're lying. <laughs> well, here's what happened. I learned this as a young man. What they said might have hurt me, but they did more to help me than did to hurt me. So I just let it go. I've gained more than that. They had a bad day, so what? I've had them too. But my life has been enriched. Because they what? I, I mean, I've been backsliding week, but I didn't know certain things, right? We got a dictionary, read the word, and taught a Bible class off a definition. There's no depth to our reading, to our understanding. But I know something now. <laughs> I got more than dictionary now. Amen? And so, here what happened is God helps us 
God would teach us to bear the with the grace of you have to, you have to give up. Bible said, except a corner we fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. I can't do it by myself. I gotta die to self. I gotta say, God, I don't know. Help me, God. And, and, and Jesus said, uh, I think in Luke he says, let's man take up his cross and die. How long? Daily. That's scary. Every day. We dying every day. Somebody trying to kill us every day. Little Lamar, they thought they were more worthy than you, but God made choice. I didn't choose this. God chose this. Yeah. Can't have been a pastor. I won't even put my name in. I don't want to be no pastor. You lose your life too quick. You lose it so quick, you don't know you even lost it. You get a day off. Ain't nothing to do. I don't know what to do no more. But God knows what he's doing. He can take the most unlikely candidate and anoint him. Let him blow your mind. He ain't no preacher. I say, he's sure preaching now. Hey, come on, somebody. He's sure preaching now. The Lord's hand is on his life. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? He'll do it. So, here God authorizes. I talked to a young man about Stephen. Stephen was no preacher. He does a good digging. The Bible says he's full of wisdom, and he did miracles. You ain't got to be a preacher to do miracles. The Bible goes further. He says, it says, your sons and your daughters. I want God to stand up in this church. I want to see our kids prophesy. I want to see our kids lay hands. I say, the Lord just healed me. We can't forbid the children to work in the service of God. But the Bible says to me, reach me, said to me, says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Here's the problem, right? People today, when we come along, watch y'all. I remember Pentecost, we sat on milk crates and had fellowship. You remember that? We didn't have much. Was it woman over or what's out there, whatever it is? And my boss said to me, uh, I bought my first house in 1970-something. He said, it's out there in uh, whatever place out there. In, uh, they call that the uh, old Willow Run, what they call that. Wherever it was, I said, I said to myself, if that's where you want me to live, that's where I live, whatever. He didn't think I should. I lived in West Willow. West Willow was pretty decent back then, right or wrong. There was a cream of the, I remember, a burden court was sliding. Right on the street was a cream of the crop, right or wrong. We didn't have much. But God has something better for all of us. My son-in-law, my daughter came out with the baby the other day, see me, and they got, the house is so quiet, they want to stay the night with me because it's not quiet in my house. It is at their house. I said, sure, y'all can stay the night, y'all want to. My wife is gone, it's a bachelor pad now. God has a place for you. He wants the world to be quiet. So you hear his voice. You ain't be hakamasha, shalanamana. No, just be quiet. The time you spend with God doesn't be time loud. Be speaking tongues, shouting and dancing. Just lay me for the Lord. Just speak, Lord, that I serve him here. The pastors got to hear every week right on, pastor. Every week we got to hear right or wrong. Sunday morning is a major issue. You got to have something to say. God got to, one Sunday morning, and I believe, I don't believe in saying nothing unless God tell me to say it. And God didn't say nothing. I said, Lord, please say something. Choir sang, I said, please, please. please. He ain't say nothing. The choir sang and rocked the house. And somebody said, Pastor Jones, that's the greatest song I've ever heard. I didn't preach. God know when he going to work. He, you ain't got to say something every Sunday. All you want is for God to show up. For God to bless the house. For God to save somebody. Come on, y'all. I got to oh, gotta tune up and say, uh, mm-hmm. Ain't it all right, somebody? 
He didn't say all that. Come on. When you get old, you will learn how to talk without moaning. Because <laughs> you lost it. You can't moan no more. I told Pastor Bishop Wiggins, I said, Bishop, man, I said, I should sweat out of clothes. I don't sweat no more. I don't sweat no more. I live back in the chair right here. I was in, in Bahamas, and Bishop Midwinter at Bahamas Council, Bishop Parenton said, Bishop Gates was there a few weeks before we were there. He said, that young man sat there in that chair. He had operated his leg or something, couldn't stand up. That young man sat there in that chair and preached under the anointing. I never forgot that one. You know what I did? I sat there in that chair. <laughs> I sat there in that chair and I preached under the anointing. <laughs> Ain't no shame in my game. Come on, somebody. And God is just as faithful. You ain't got to perform to help God. Just believe that God is God. I learned in the life of prayer, God intrinsically infuses himself into your mind that he's unconsciously in your conversation. You get breakfast, eating some eggs and toast and drink a little coffee. You might say, do you realize what you just said? You was prophesying, didn't know it. Say you were poor, didn't know it. A prophet didn't know it. Was speaking on the power of God. That somebody's life was changed. Somebody was given direction to their future. He said, "Oh, shot, 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 shot. You ain't gonna do all that." <laughs> Come on, being too plain, Elder. God will help you. Come on, help me, somebody. Oh, the Lord is the very present help. Faith is a walk in which one step follows another. Little by little. I've been saved 57 years. I didn't get it overnight. There's times the things that drove me to prayer. Sometimes hurt will make you pray. If you don't pray, you will not survive. The only pray said, said saints, I was at a meeting once at uh, Bishop Jake's conference and uh, I remember Paula White. Well, the guy she was married to, that weekend I was there, he said, last week I was considering giving up. I was so hurt. But the saints gathered around me and they began to pray. And God helped me. Well, Paula White since then went off and she's riding with the president. And uh, who's that? Uh, oh, well, not sure. What's her late name on the East Coast? Um, huh? No, McCullough's are here. No, McCullough's out in New York. Different lady in my heart. Shaw Swaller. And she said to Paula White, she said, you used us. I can get you in the White House. She said, my ministry is not in the White House. You preached us as though you were one of us. He really wasn't a part of us. But her husband since then is now, they separated in different ways. There's times even preachers need prayer. I told Bishop Thorne, he said to me, he hung with Buddha Bismarck, Bishop Wagner, one of the greatest bishops out of Africa, Nigeria, and so he says, you pray for a person of authority, Bishop. You pray down. You don't grab their head, grab their legs, and ask them if they want you to go higher. He wants, Bishop Pastor Jones, he wants to lay hands on you. Then claim the credit for what God did in your life. I was going to go to Africa. I said, can we pray for you? Said, don't lay your hands on me. You can pray, but don't put your hands on me. I want God to get the glory for what he does in my life. Sometimes God brings me to a place that can't nobody get the glory but God. Um, in Romans 4, the steps that Abraham took was progressive. You go from Genesis 12 to Genesis 22, you will see the various progressions of Abraham's faith. In chapter 22, his faith came to the grand climax. But what he did in chapter 22, he never could have done in chapter 12. His faith came to that climax because every time God said step, he stepped. Every time God gave him a challenge, he accepted. So his faith was progressively built up. Through obedience, each step, things you go through. 
I said on the case with Ella Johnson, I said, in the beginning of my pastor, I built, I, I buried the equivalent of a storefront church. People are dying like crazy. Remember that? Left and right. Strong saints. Kitchen. Trustees. Deacons. And that's a challenge to a pastor's heart. Would you agree? Some people are the best help you've ever seen. And the ones behind them didn't get what they had. I was at uh, uh, Bethel. Pastor Taylor preached. Somebody, I think, whose friend I was. And he cried. said, that sister was the best saint she ever passed. You can't replace. You can ask. You got to go in your, in your prayer. God, send me somebody. You can ride with them. You got to eat with them. You need help to help you. It's fine. You have to ask it. It showed up. But that's what you deal with. Lost. And Sister Grantham said, like everybody I go to love die. That's, 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 that's part of life. We deal with more than anybody else, right or wrong. We see church growing and they die. Either they leave or they die. Yeah. You gotta accept that, give God the glory, and keep moving. The Lord said to me, He said, This is my church. And I'm gonna take care of this work because I ordained this work. I said, Emma Clinton, there's, there's a promise of God. I knew uh, uh, F.E. Johnson. I knew him personally. Speaking tongues like that. He's called Longhead Johnson. <laughs> there's a word God gave him that hasn't yet been manifested. This, God gave Ella Ware a word. It's not just you. All those people that God gave a promise to are standing in line to be fulfilled. And what anybody does, He's still faithful. And I've been in a position of neutrality and let God be God and worry about what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. But I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. In the So we have, some of us have our Isaacs, some of us have our Ishmaels. What is it? Isaacs, when we, Ishmael rather, when we decided God ain't moving fast enough and we got to do something. One guy said, I, I put some people in place and it was disastrous. They turned on me. They split the church because what? He said, I moved too fast. Ask God for grace. God, what should I do? Who's the right person? And so, he had to wait on God. It is disastrous to grasp for a God-given inheritance by carnal means. Um, In the scriptures, God has to give us this desire to seek his face, to pray, uh, to look to the word. And I think it's Acts, Luke rather, one thirteen, but the angel said unto them, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayers is heard. The wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, thou shalt call his name John. But these all continued uh, with one accord in prayer. In the New Testament book of Acts, it's amazing. Almost every page you turn, they were praying. But we read it like a novel. It's, 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 a, it's an outlay of a blueprint of how the church is to be built through prayer. We don't read it like a novel. We They pray, we got to pray. Uh, and all throughout, I ran a, a reference. Every page you turn, they're praying. The Holy Ghost fell with great anointing for 10 days and went into prayer. After that, a man, the apostle pulled in and threatened not to preach them more in that name. And they counted a blessing to be threatened for the name of Jesus. And they prayed again. And the Bible said, and the whole house was filled. Here's the point here again. Back in the old day, watch this. I don't know how much y'all do it now. But sometimes we had a refreshing service. One occasion with a youth choir, we had some problems. 
I'm trying to figure out how to solve them. And the Lord gave me a plan. Here's a plan he gave me. I came to rehearsal one night. I said, tonight, we're not going to rehearse tonight. I have the altar workers here. And if you don't speak in tongues tonight, you ain't singing no more. So I'm out of here. I said, bye. They sang, they prayed, and it solved all their problems that one night. So just let me be refreshed. You're not a bad person. The stress of life has got, even as preachers, the stress of life gets to us. Uh, in the case when Joe's wife wants you to curse God and die, I figured that out. That's the agony of a caregiver. We get tired of seeing our loved ones suffer. And much as we love them, we say, Lord, let them rest. As a pastor, we deal with so many things. The Lord showed me, he said to me, the only peace you will experience in this church is the peace I give you. Watch, when he sends it, use it to pray. Use it to seek his face. Don't ask God, Lord, I need more time to study and pray. He said, so I'm going to give it to you. Remember why I gave it to you. What do you mean by that? Don't go shopping on me. Use that time to study and to pray. We have so many sidetrack distractions that don't let us, because the apostle said, we must give ourselves to the word of God in prayer. Well, I ain't got to preach, so I ain't going to study. You need to study anyway. You need to pray anyway. There's been lessons God gave me, and I studied for weeks on end, putting together an outline. And when I finished, the calls began to come in. I asked one person, I says, who told you to call me? He says, the time I got a call, the Lord told me to call you. The time is not yet revealed. Peace is for a given assignment. God gave Solomon peace so he can build a temple. David, your hands are too bloody. You can't build it. You can gather material, but you can't build a house. Because your hands are too bloody. We're too distracted. And I recognize raising those kids, I still gave myself to prayer. Remember now, like three days like you, young people are so busy trying to get what we got. They don't know it took us all our life. <laughs> all our life. All our credit. <laughs> right or wrong? To get to where we are today. We can help them, but, but 20 years ago, I couldn't help them. I couldn't even buy my McDonald's hamburger 20 years ago. I can buy all of them one now. <laughs> Time has changed. But I was still seeking God. Church is always priority, right or wrong? Okay, well, when we went to the United States of America, we were told we had to be back home on Sunday morning, period. Amen. For Sunday school. Amen. <laughs> Not Sunday morning, Sunday school. <laughs> and we did it. And guess what? And it helped us. Temptation came. I can live. It was hard. Some days I cried. Somebody, somebody gave, attended me one time. I said, I don't need no more trouble in my life. <laughs> I appreciate the offer. Some, some tests come to encourage you. What do you mean by that? You still got it. <laughs> you got to decide what you want. I could have had a date, but I don't want no date. It's not, it's not lawful. I got a wife. <laughs> I want to be saved. So the thing we do, we want to please God. Prayer would teach us the mind of God and bring to mind the scriptures that we forgot. How to treat people. Some people need an extra bit of kindness. I know you had a bad day, but today you can't let that show. Because you would thin your church out with a bad attitude. They think you're mad at them. They ain't mad at you. They're just mad. They got a right to be mad, but use the grace of God to keep you from showing that stuff. Everybody needs kindness. Everybody needs kindness. So, my time's about up. I'm not done. I'm about up. I don't worry about that. Uh, I did a series on, series on, on uh, the grace of yielding and prayer. But you know, the church needs help. We need help. If you can look around today, look at our faces. Remember those faces in prayer. The faces who are not here. 
I discovered in Pentecost, we want it to be exciting. Some things that are spiritual and helpful are not exciting. They're just necessary. Until I feel a shout coming on, I don't shout. I learn to listen, see what is it God is saying to the church for this hour. What he's saying, I can't miss it just because we were shouting. I'm not against them, we're wrong. God has some things to say to us. I used to be a photographer back in the day. I took a lot of pictures. I was going through my picture up one day. I saw some pictures of my wife and I together, and she was smiling and grinning. The Lord said to me, when she was grinning right there, he said, you was cracking on Joe. She was grinning because she was happy. There were some other pictures. She wasn't, she wasn't smiling no more. He said, you need to find out what's going on. That's how God is. He said, you need to find out what's going on. Make I tell you, guess what I saw? No, you ain't got to see nothing. God will tell you, you need to check this stuff out. There's a pastor. You need to check this out. Now, not to be suspicious. There's a level of ministry that the church needs sometimes. Watch this. Because what we're going through, we're not providing. It's not your fault. But you've been loaded down with a, a heavy weight of concern. You wasn't able. You had to stop. You had to go and watch this and shut, close the doors, pull the shades, and get down on your knees and say, God, we need some help. Thanks today, want to know. One person said to me, said, my, my son-in-law said, my wife and I was church hopping last Sunday on, on YouTube. They watched every church in the country that they like. So they're comparing us to everybody else. You said everybody competing. One thing the Lord told me, Bishop Farrell, he taught me not to compete, just do what he told me to do. I can't do what you're doing. I do what I do. He gave me a level of innovation that I can do more than I've done called helping that I couldn't do. And but watch out, Josh, I told the ministers here, I call the best teachers in this country to deal with prayer and work on all that. Y'all should be having a prayer conference. Sharing what y'all know. Not criticize, I'm saying people want to know. They want to, how do I release the power in my life? How can I take this Holy Ghost home in my house? Ella, 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 Ella Johnson was younger. What's Ella Johnson? Folks are getting the Holy Ghost in their kitchen and their living room. Remember that? In the hospital room. This time the Lord laid him on my heart. I go by and see him, and pray for him, get up and leave. And, and he called me again and he's down sick again. I just went by the leading. It wasn't me. There's something in each one of you in this room that God has has not been revealed yet. But it's for his glory and not for your self-grandizement. I learned that oh, I, I work with you a long time. A lot of times I was overlooked. One time I was at home, Ellen, you wasn't around then. I ran for office in the car, so it wasn't against you, somebody else. That's kind of sad. Yes, I learned right here. Because somebody else wins don't mean they didn't want you. That was not God's choice for this season. And I had a motorcycle back then, a, a, a Honda Goldwing, big, pretty, big bike. Honda's biggest. I'm going for a ride out to Dexter and Chelsea and around the lake and chill. And the Holy Ghost said, you know better than that. You don't ride on the lake for peace of mind. You go to God in prayer. I repented. Went to my prayer room, got on my knees, and I began to pray. And the Holy Ghost took a text in the book of Genesis and preached all the way through, Gen through a revelation. So the place of your persecution was once your place of deliverance. When God got time for Israel to move, he's in some more trouble and moved them out of there. I don't mean move, move physically from my church. It's time for me to move up. In case I had a movement, a desire in my heart, I said, God, I need more. He sent me to a source that cost me $6,000 a study material that I needed. I bought it like a used car. Then a few years later, I run to it again, another ten or fifteen thousand dollars. I bought it like another used car, and God began to feed me. What's this, Elder? This is from Bishop McClendon and Burrell, you guys. Everything not on us. You should be willing to study for yourself, because when you get the knife and the fork, to me, we ain't. We feed you with the best we got. Some of y'all should be helping the pastor out. 
Everybody waiting for us to get, tell them what to do and tell them how to do it. You can help somebody. Watch, when I was a kid, Lord, remember, I was a pastor, I'm going to quit right now. Remind me of this. When I was a kid, the older kids had to watch the younger kids. Right. And if you didn't watch them, you got your behind whooped as well. <laughs> In the church, the older saints should be helping the younger saints. Right there McClinton, Bishop McClinton. They should, be, they should be helping. Bishop, do you mind if I help? I said, sure, honey. Now, a man right here, he teaches the foundation course for new members. I figured some out. A lot of people backslide, but they don't know what they got. We got to understand the foundation of the faith, and it cut down a lot of backsliding. But something we've done it for so long, guess what? Y'all should know what to do. But here's what happened. When the confidence is given by how you handle your own life. Your own tests, own trial, not a part of gossip and rumors. But who else are you, who are you helping? So I got to go to another church to get what God got for me. In 1980 something, the Word of Faith people came to me and asked me to run their operation. So I feel led to stay with my pastor and help him out. And I stayed. But I learned their resources, I studied their material. I found out who their mentors was, and I fed off of it, and I studied it. I love the baptism in Jesus' name. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God above us all. I believe all of that. There's something else to it, y'all. To build the faith of the saints, the church become a part of that glorious church. Mr. Paddock stayed in my house, slept on my bed. The honor the short. It's like I let him stay in my house when he chased my girl. <laughs> <laughs> he was young and single. I didn't mind it. I didn't mention because he mentioned it. I'm saying, but it's an honor to serve God. It's an honor to serve his people. You all have something in you that God has put in you. It's more than you asked for. You ask God to give me a greater hunger, a greater desire to be a greater blessing. Amen? Amen. Sister, I say, Sister Jones, Pastor Jones, I pray to God that you see Sunday morning before Sunday morning to get here. See his hand moving in the congregation, amen? Moving across the aisles, moving down the road. God bless you today. In Jesus' name, the, the grace of yielding. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.